Who done it? It's a genre and a question that continues to grab people and audiences. Whether it's the Agatha Christie novels, Arthur Conan Doyle's, the board game Clue, Cluedo for us thirties in the UK, various films, or even The Simpsons. <laughs> well, I couldn't possibly solve this mystery. Can you? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. I mean, you know, it's my job, right? For decades, the genre has been dominated by two main names, the OG, Sherlock Holmes, and Christie's creation, Hercule Poirot. Enter Ryan Johnson to bring his own take and introduce a new name into the genre, that of the southern drawling, cigar-smoking, gentleman sleuth, Benoit Blanc. CSI KFC? Hello, folks. Today, let's take a look at the film that launched what is arguably Daniel Craig's second most iconic role, Knives Out. Released in 2019, Knives Out stars an ensemble cast including Anna de Armas, Tony Collette, Jamie Lee Curtis, Chris Evans and Christopher Plummer in his last film appearance before his death. Like the southern gentleman himself, I'll be diving into the screenplay of this film to see what made it work. I'll be examining the story synopsis and structure, themes, characterizations, dialogue, how it was received upon its release and my own personal thoughts. Now let's take a look at this here melting pot of characters and motivations and see what made Knives Out such a hit that Netflix would trip over themselves to secure the franchise rights. Sorry. I won't do that again. Let's do Knives Out. We open with puppies, always the best judge of character, bringing us into a massive country manor and the hook. Housekeeper Fran, played by Eddie Patterson, is making breakfast for the house's owner, along with a massive cup of coffee. We see that the house is stacked full of books from the successful novelist Harlan Fromby, who Fran is coincidentally delivering the breakfast to. Or at least she's trying to. He's not in his bedroom, so she activates a secret door up to his study hoping to find him. She does. The first act begins a week later as we are introduced to Marta, played by Ana de Armas, Harlan's former nurse and protagonist of the film. But wait a minute, Stumo, you fool, I hear you say. Marta isn't the main character of Knives Out, that's Benoit Blanc. It's his movie, he's the one in the sequel, and it's his franchise. How can you be so stupid, you charlatan? Well, first off, you got some attitude, mister. Secondly, like Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, he may be the breakout character, but he's not the protagonist of the film. It's not his journey to go on, but Marta's. She's the protagonist. You arsehole! We see Marta's living situation, shacked up with her mother and her sister Alice, played by Marlene Fuerte and Shirley Rodriguez respectively. Alice is watching the climax of a detective show, much to her mother's chagrin who chastises her. He Your sister talking. just had a friend okay. she loves okay. slit his throat okay. open and she doesn't okay. need to be Never. hearing that right now. Let's be sensitive. Marta doesn't really mind. Looking at her phone and seeing an incoming call from Walt asking her to return to the manor to speak to the polis, which makes her worried. At the house, she meets up with the Fromby family. Firstly, Meg, the young left-wing college student of the family who stands up for her when the polis ask her if she's with the help, played by Catherine Langford. She takes her up to the house where Linda Drysdale, Harlan's daughter, opens the door, played by the always classic Jamie Lee Curtis. How you doing, kiddo? Linda. Marta is greeted fondly by her and her husband Richard, played by Don Johnson. Both are so sorry that Marta couldn't be at the funeral, saying they were outvoted. They're also frustrated as Harlan clearly slit his own throat in an obvious suicide, so why are the cops poking around again? The interviews begin, led by Detective Elliot and Trooper Wagner, played by Lakeith Stanfield and Noah Sagan. We begin with Linda, establishing the events of the night of the party, or at least her version of the night. That's going to be a running theme, so make sure you pay attention. She paints a pretty picture, introducing her son Ransom, played by Chris Evans, and Great Nana, Harlan's mother, played by Catherine Callan. Wow, how old is she? We have no idea. We also discover that Marta is from Ecuador. Linda runs a real estate firm, sorry, her real estate firm with Richard that she built from the ground up, a self-made woman. She was also close with her father. 
we, uh, we had our own secret way of communicating. Next up is her husband, Richard, who... Seems like all his kids are self-made overachievers. Sure. Then it's Walt Fromby, Harlan's youngest son, played by Michael Shannon, who runs a publishing company around Harlan's books. In his version of the night are his unflappable wife Donna, played by Ricky Lindholm, and his politically active son Jacob, played by Jaden Martell. The boy is literally a Nazi. He's an alt-right troll dipshit. Kids today with the internet, it's amazing. <laughs> all in all, it was a great night. And now we have Joni, played by Tony Collette, Meg's mother and widow to Harlan's son, Neil. The Frombies love her and have accepted her as one of their own, as well as her skincare company, Flam. Yeah, it's skincare, but it promotes a total lifestyle. Self-sufficiency with an acknowledgement of human need. That's Flam. More importantly, Harlan gives her a 100k allowance and pays Meg's college payments for her crypto-Marxist post deconstructural feminist poetry theory whatever major constantly in the background is a third man not him who keeps playing a key on the piano to keep them on track so who the fuck is that that is benoit blanc a private investigator of great renown walt takes umbrage if if, if one of us killed him one of his no, family no, walt, walt, killed him no is that no. what you're suggesting lieutenant I read a tweet about a New Yorker article about you. I read your profile in The New Yorker. I found it delightful. Why are you here? Blanc has been hired by an unknown party to reinvestigate the case and observe the truth. He asks about Marta. Richard says they see her as a member of the family and she loves them too. Families from Paraguay. He then virtue signals. Immigrants, we get the job done. I... From Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton. <laughs> we cut seamlessly back to Linda as Blanc probes her for information about Walt's publishing empire. But surely Walt runs the merchandising, adaptations, film and television rights. I mean, are you baiting me, detective? You know he doesn't. And if you think I am dumb enough to be baited into talking family business, into shit-talking my baby brother in front of a police detective and a state trooper. Walt doesn't run shit. No. Things start to become a little clearer. Turns out at the party, Walt had a conversation with Harland that didn't end well for him, which Walt denies. In truth, Walt tried to get some adaptation rights to Netflix, lol, real life foreshadowing, and Harlan cut him loose from publishing the books and controlling that side of the business. Dad, are you firing me? No, <laughs> we'll talk details tomorrow. Yes, he was. Walt tries to write it off as a conversation about ebooks and deflects attention towards an argument Harlan had with Ransom, the family's black sheep. Interestingly, his version of Ransom's exit does not include a tender touch to Nana. Back to Richard, and Blanc reveals that he spoke to the caterer who overheard he was having an argument with Richard in his study. You tell her or I will. Turns out, Richard has been shagging behind Linda's back and Harlan knows. He wants Richard to tell her the truth or... You tell her or I will. Richard tries to write it off as Harlan finally putting Nana in a home. Sorry, forgot. Richard, Walt, and Ransom weren't the only ones to have a fraca with Harlan. Now it's Joni's turn. Turns out she's been double dipping Meg's tuition from Harlan for the last four years and he's caught her. Know that this is the last money you or Meg will get from me. Is it a money wiring issue? No big deal. Richard goes searching for the letter Harlan wrote for Linda and finds it, seeing that it's completely blank thinking that Harlan was bluffing about the whole thing. Son of a bitch. He relaxes, throwing Harlan's baseball out of the window for the dogs. So we have a whole bunch of family members, all with possible motivations for offing Harlan, all lying and deflecting attention onto each other. But Harlan committed suicide, so how does any of this add up? And yes, I'm going to keep doing the voice, fuck you. Detective Elliot wonders this as well and questions Blanc about the necessity of the follow-up interviews. Marta spies them from inside the house. Blanc gets wind of her and seizes the opportunity to do some impromptu questioning. Marta was hired on a part-time basis personally by Harland and gradually her hours went up. He needed a friend. 
deducing that Marta, in her friendship with Harlan, has become a confidant and privy to a lot of the family's secrets, he probes further, asking if a rumor he has heard is true. You have a regurgitative reaction to Miss Truden. <laughs> she admits she does. Just the thought of lying, yeah, it, it makes, makes me puke. Blanc seizes his chance and asks if Richard really is shagging behind Linda's back. Of course he is. And of course, she knows. She lies. Of course, causing her to puke. Oh, shit! Oh, oh, dear oh girl, gosh. I'm sorry. I assumed oh, yeah, you were speaking figuratively. Blanc's suspicions about Richard are confirmed. But it's not enough for Elliot to suspect foul play. He also works out that Harlan cut off Joni's allowance when he found out she was double dipping from him. Elliot is still unconvinced. Again, more weak sauce. You're just dumping that vat of weak sauce on Granted. Me. Blanc realizes that Harlan was tying up loose ends and fired Walter from the publishing company. Elliot lets Marta go back inside as Blanc finally tells him why he's there. He's there because someone delivered an envelope containing an inciting incident, a stack full of cash, and a clipping of Harlan's suicide. Who hired him? I do not know. Someone thinks it wasn't just a suicide, and he intends to find out why. It, it makes no damn sense. It compels me, though. The question of who hired Blanc and why is the catalyst for the film, and who better to help him get to the bottom of that question than Harlan's closest confidant, Marta. Of course, she's jittery and doesn't want the attention, refusing the call. She doesn't want to help him, she just wants to be left alone, for reasons we will come to very soon. Blanc asks Elliot to walk him through the events after the party. Harlan and Marta retreated upstairs at 11.30. A short time later, Joni heard a loud noise that caused her to go up and investigate, causing the stairs to creak and waking Linda. Harlan told her they knocked over the goal board that they were playing with, and 10 minutes later, Marta was seen leaving the house by Walt at midnight. Shortly after, Linda was awoken again as Harlan went back downstairs, with Walt telling him to go back to bed. Around that time, Meg came back, and at 3am she woke up to the sound of the dogs barking. Everything adds up, everyone is in sync. Harlan slit his own throat. Blanc remains unconvinced. Physical evidence can tell a clear story with a false tongue. Ryan Johnson has a habit of setting up certain expectations and then subverting them. He's done it before, controversially, with The Last Jedi. Whether or not he was successful there is a topic for another day. Here, we have certain expectations about the families and how one, or perhaps even more of them, are connected in some way to Harlan's death. Now, let's take a look at how those expectations become subverted. Marta's interview begins. Blanc asks her to recall in as much detail as possible what happened when they went upstairs. In the flashback, we see Harlan refusing to go to bed on time and demanding that Marta play a game of go with him on his birthday before taking his medicine. Reluctantly, she agrees, kicking his ass. It's elder abuse. I'm gonna call the AARP. Don't make me get the belt, abuelo. Quite the sore loser, Harlan knocks over the goal board and then allows Marta to finally do her job. Harlan comes down from the night's escapades, having cut the line on all four of them and lamenting allowing his children to become nepotism babies suckling from his own teat instead of making their own careers and money, especially Ransom. Oh, there's so much of me in that kid. Ransom lives heedlessly, carelessly, and can't even tell the difference between a stage knife and a real one. With Chekhov's gun now loaded, Marta offers to give Harlan some hard opioids. Oh, come and send me to... Uh... La la la. Just a ah. tiny bit, okay? As he prepares to train Spotter up, Marta makes a horrifying discovery. She just gave him morphine, a hundred milligrams of it, instead of the three milligrams she was just about to give him. With roughly ten minutes before he becomes like Tommy, she frantically searches for naloxone, while Harlan cavalierly pegs that this is an effective method for murdering someone. Another problem. She can't find the naloxone and an ambulance won't get there in time. The reality of the situation starts to sink in for them. Panicking, Marta tries to call an ambulance anyway, only for Harlan to stop her. She tries to call the family, but Harlan trips her up, the real sound that Joni heard. Harlan's only concern is making sure that Marta isn't tied to it. Oh we have got to get you out of this. After ushering Joni away, Harlan tells her that if she's found out, her undocumented mother will most likely be punted or at worst, put in a cage. It was 2019 after all. 
He devises a plan for her to be the most unlikely suspect. Step 1. Leave past Walt, pointing out the time. Step 2. Pull over before the carved elephant to avoid the security cameras. Or was it after the elephant? The after for the carved elephant. Oh, shit. She gets it wrong. Step 3. Pass the friendly puppies and climb up the trellis to the third floor to avoid the creaky stairs. You gotta be kidding me. I am not. Do it. Unfortunately, she takes part of the trellis out on her way up to the trick window. Step 4. Don Harlan's dressing gown and cap to go down and be seen by Walt through the glazed window. Step 5. GTFO the same way she got in without being seen. Ransom? Are you back again already? Well, shit. Marta says she can't lie, physically, and Harlan tells her to just tell parts of the truth. Which she does, mentioning everything but the unfortunate medical mix-up. Did you notice anything strange or off about his demeanor? That seems to satisfy Blanc and Elliot, and she leaves to immediately empty the rest of her breakfast. Linda reads through the previous letters between her and Harlan, written with invisible ink, mourning that nothing makes sense and finding comfort in Walt. At Harlan's wake, Fran tells Marta about her hobby of watching Hallmark movies that are closer to reality than we think, along with her cousin who works at the medical examiner's office. Marta flashes back to the night of the party, particularly the politics part of the evening. The family are arguing about… that guy, and getting very vocal. Joni is fighting the good, if insincere fight, while Richard and Donna go all Fox News. Oh no, 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 we are losing our way of life and our culture. It's true, America is for America. Don't point- Richard drags Marta begrudgingly into the conversation as an example of a good immigrant. Marta, your family is from Uruguay, but you did it right. While giving her his dish. They overhear the end of the argument between Ransom and Harlan and witness Ransom's storm out. Back to the present, Marta has a panic attack. Meg and Fran bring her to Fran's stash. Meg offers her the really good shit, but she declines. Walt approaches Marta, saying that the family want to support her for her services to their father. Have you been smoking grass? No. <laughs> he also says sorry she wasn't at the funeral, he was outvoted too. Apparently, the family held one of those Russian-style elections. Escaping outside, Marta finds Blanc, lurking in the shadows of the first act turning point. Blanc thinks more is going on, and that Marta knows it too. They have a connection, having both heard of Gravity's Rainbow, but neither of them having read it. Marta has a kind heart and no motive to kill Harlan, so he wants her to help him unravel the mystery. So how about it, Watson? They begin tomorrow. Marta arrives home, where her mother is watching some Assassinato Ella Escribio. She remembers her final interaction with Harlot. Unable to go through with it, she came back to help him. And everything will be just fine. No. I promise. <laughs> Unfortunately, she didn't notice that some of Harlan's blood got on her shoe. The first act reaches its terminus. Marta is entering the new world of trying to help Blanc unravel the mystery of Harlan's death. The only problem is, she knows the answer and she killed Harlan by accident. In order to keep herself in the clear, she's going to have to stay one step ahead of him. And she is physically incapable of lying. The genre has changed. What began as a whodunit has morphed into a how-will-she-get-away-with-it style thriller. A cat and mouse game is a shoe. I mean a foot. The second act begins the next day at 8am. Marta joins Blanc, Elliot and Wagner as they talk to the head of security at the Fromby estate, Mr. Proofrock, played by M. Emmett Walsh. While viewing the live feed, Marta realises she fucked up, turning off the trail too soon and would have been picked up by the security cameras. Worse still, Proofrock has the entire evening's activities on VHS. Ever heard of Betamax, pal? While they view the tape, Marta ejects it right before she would be revealed, burning out the player and securing the tape for Elliot and Wagner to digitise later. As they patrol the grounds, Marta scrambles the tape using a magnet she picked up via a five-finger discount from Proofrock, before Wagner thinks it might be a better idea to keep hold of it. Walking further ahead, she sees her own muddy footprints leading up to the gate. Shiting herself, she walks through them, sabotaging them before Blanc can stop her as the puppies show back up. 
Best judge of character is a dog. I found that to be true. The dogs run over to greet Linda, who has arrived ahead of an imminent will reading. Blanc and Marta approach the house as one of the dogs brings the broken trellis over for a game of fetch. Blanc gets jump scared by Nana, allowing Marta the opportunity she needs to throw it away. They visit Harlan's study, where they are unable to find Marta's medical bag, assuming it has been taken in as evidence. Blanc knocks over the goal board, noticing it sounds a lot quieter than initially reported. Outside, Ransom arrives for the will reading, finding himself harassed by the dogs. Elliot and Wagner greet him by calling him Hugh. Call me Ransom, it's my middle name. Only the help calls me Hugh. They, along with Blanc, try to ask him some questions, but he blows them off for a packet of Biscoff cookies. He meets the rest of the family, trading barbs with Meg and ordering Fran around. Walt antagonizes him, saying that he skipped out on the funeral but is early for the will reading. Tempers start to rise as it's revealed that Jacob overheard Ransom and Harland arguing when he was in the bathroom, joylessly masturbating to pictures of dead deer. Walt and Richard engage in a manly slap fight. Oh can handle it. Oh my god. <laughs> you gotta do this more often. Turns out, in between jacking sessions, Jacob heard two things. Harlan mentioning his will and Ransom warning him. Walt uses all of his brain power to figure out that Harlan has in fact cut Ransom out of the will, which Ransom confirms. The family agree that the spoilt little brat deserves it. This might be the best thing that could ever happen to you. Thank you. My mother, ladies and gentlemen. Ransom shows why he's America's arsehole. Eat shit. How's that? Do not use that word in front of my Eat shit. Eat shit. Eat shit. Blanc leaves the family to their squabbling. Blanc wonders the meaning behind Ransom's warning as one of the dogs comes up to play fetch, bringing the broken trellis with it. Naturally following the clues, he checks it and spots the trick window. He, Marta, Elliot and Wagner discover the trick window and examine the carpet, finding mud traces on it and the windowsill. Blanc is rejuvenated with a new clue while Marta shites herself. The family gather for the will reading, led by Harlan's counsel, Alan, played by Master Yoda himself, Frank Oz, and his paralegal, Sally, played by Carrie Francis. Blanc requests that the family stay in town and Elliot makes it an order. Alan continues, stating that he asked them to be there as Harlan amended his will a week before his death, making some changes regarding the distribution of the house, $60 million, and the publishing company, Blood Like Wine. The will reading begins, and in case you hadn't guessed yet, we are at the screenplay's midpoint. Shit's about to go down. The will is short. I hereby direct that all my assets, both liquid and otherwise, I leave in their entirety to Marta Cabrera. Yep. Crisis point. Uh, no. That's not... No. That's... No. Yes, it is. Ransom loves it, leaving as the family collectively shite themselves, realizing they haven't gotten a single red dime. Linda tries to rally them. We are the thrombies, goddammit! This is still our house! Actually, that went to Marta too. Oh, you little... Bitch, you oh, uh, little Linda. bitch! The family round on Marta, accusing her of boinking Harland, and the Nazi even throws a slur her way. Blanc tries to hold them off, telling Marta to GTFO. She does, but they follow her, all shouting at once, corralling her while the little Nazi boy hate streams the entire affair. She retreats to her car, which decides to troll her by not starting. Amidst the chaos, she sees an unlikely way out. Ransom. She jumps into his car. I think this could be the best thing to happen to all of you! They drive away, leaving the family shell-shocked. Ransom takes her to lunch, where he confides that he felt a sense of clarity after being cut from the will, and he also knows that Harlan didn't commit suicide. After Marta devours some baked beans and sausage, he makes her tell her everything that happened that night. You asshole. Marta, tell me everything. Meanwhile, the family are still making Alan's brain melt, desperately trying to find a way to undo the will. Joni googles the Slayer rule that states that if the inheritee is implicated in the death of the deceased, they forfeit the will under the eyes of the law. Like OJ? Yes, like OJ. But Harlan committed suicide? Suddenly, the family become very interested in Blanc and his investigation. I have eliminated no suspects. 
Richard isn't having it, saying that they just need to get Marta to renounce the will, releasing Alan from his purgatory. Meg tells Joni that if Harlan wanted Marta to get the inheritance, then she should get it. Joni reveals to her that without it, they have no money. I guess Flam isn't taking off like she implied. Back at the restaurant, Ransom takes in everything Marta has said, his main takeaway being that he always thought he was the only one that could beat Harlan at Go. He decides to help Marta, in exchange for his cut of the inheritance. Before Marta can agree, Meg calls her. Once her ally, now faced with the reality of her situation, Meg turns Brutus. She tells Marta to give back the money, that Joni is broke and that no one knows she's calling. Marta tells her she won't let anything happen to her. Meg hangs up, revealing the family pulling her strings. Resigned, Marta realises she has to work with Ransom, who urges her to lay low. That's a little difficult, as the next day Harlan's will makes the news and their home is crawling with reporters. Are we rich? At the Fromby estate, Blanc approaches Nana. While the rest of the family are off worrying about their own asses, he talks to her like a human being and believes she saw something that she wants to share. He waits patiently. Swarmed with opportunistic lawyer mail, Marta tries to slip out the back door, <laughs> running into Walt. He tries the tactic of getting her to renounce the will, not so subtly hinting that they know her mother is an undocumented immigrant, thanks to Meg's information. He says they can make that problem disappear with their resources, which Marta, finding her inner lioness, reminds him are now hers, so she'll be fine. Better be sure that's what you want. She retreats back inside, finding a sinister letter and patching a call from Blanc. The letter shows the header of Harlan's blood toxicology report, but is missing the vital information about the morphine overdose. Someone is messing with her. They head to the coroner's office to find it burnt down. Blanc, Elliot and Wagner are already on the scene. The place is a write-off. All evidence pertaining to the case has been burnt down and the security cameras have gone the same way as the CCTV from the Fromby estate. The only thing left is the copy of the blood toxicology report that the blackmailer has. Ransom asks if she has had any correspondence from the unknown person, prompting Marta to check her email. Coincidentally, she has a new email from said person, saying to meet at an address in just under 30 minutes. Blanc spots her car and a GTFO, with Blanc and the rest of the cops in pursuit. A car chase ensues. Or rather, Marta's attempt at a car chase. Her car isn't built for that sort of thing. Blanc catches up to her as she considers her options. You miss your chance to get this tox report, it's all over. Marta improvises, driving into town and taking the narrow alleys to lose the cops. Which works. For a moment. That was the dumbest car chase of all time. Expecting the jig to be up, Marta is surprised when instead they take Ransom into custody. Turns out Nana fingered him for returning on the night of the party when she mistook Marta for him. Ransom? Are you back again already? Blanc asks Marta if he made her speed away. She says yes. <laughs> Blanc, come with us. I'll drive with Marta. Blanc pontificates on the case on their way to the station. A case with a hole in the middle. A donut. For all his renown and smarts, he is not seeing what's right in front of him. I wanted a jam donut, but the store didn't have any. Marta notices the time and makes an excuse to pull over and visit the blackmailer. She enters the address, finding her medical bag, a burnt tox report, and the blackmailer on a chair. She looks closer, discovering it's Fran, hopped up on morphine and moments away from death, holding an empty envelope. Fran tries to speak. What? Cash? What? What are you saying? And gives her a final warning. You did this. Don't get away with that. <laughs> Marta considers GTFOing and leaving her for dead, but can't bring herself to, calling an ambulance and sealing her fate instead. Blanc practices his karaoke. Not going left. Not go. Oh lord. At the hospital of the second act turning point, Marta realises the jig really is up and prepares to confess to Blanc. It doesn't matter, as Ransom has already grasped her in. She resolves to tell the Frombies the truth and fill Blanc in on the way to the third act. Marta's lowest point has arrived. 
Fran is hanging on for dear life because of her actions and it's getting out of control. She failed to stay ahead of Blanc and the detectives and now it looks like she'll be facing jail time and leaving her mother at the mercy of the Republican Party. The third act begins as they arrive back at the Fromby house, with the entire family gathered and Blanc brought up to speed. Meg apologises to Marta for grassing in her mother's status to the family and really, really needs a smoke. Marta realises the blood report is in Fran's stash. What? Stash? What? They find it and Marta hands it to Blanc, preparing for her reckoning. God, you're not much of a detective, are you? Well, to be fair, you make a pretty lousy murderer. Blanc reads a report as Marta begins her confession to the family. Suddenly, Blanc interrupts her, stopping her confession and giving them what for, with Craig's real accent slipping through. You have all treated her like shit to steal back a fortune that you lost and she deserves. He tells them he will be ruling the death of Harlan as a suicide and that Marta is keeping the money. He leads her away as Elliot and Wagner rush to catch up to them. <laughs> And now we switch genres once again, back to the original Who Done It. Another twist where R will be revealed in the classic climax where the detective lines up all of the clues and points out the true villain of the piece. Blanc brings a confused Marta and equally confused detectives into the original interrogation room, telling them that while Marta seems to have killed Harland, all is not all as it seems, and that someone truly is guilty. Someone who knew that the will was changed, that a crime had been committed, and wanted to expose Marta for their own benefit. To make Marta a slayer and nullify the changes. That excludes Fran, as she only wanted money to buy her silence. Trooper Wagner. Trooper Wagner? No. Wagner brings Ransom into the climax. Blanc begins by asking Ransom why he hired him. You're right. Let's back it up. Blanc realises that during their argument, Harlan told Ransom everything. Not just that he would be cut out of the will, but that they all would. And not just that, but that it would be going to Marta. You're Brazilian nurse. Are you goddamn insane? Ransom's moment of clarity became a moment of scheming. He snuck back to the party, used the trick window, and switched the miles of medication and morphine, grabbing the naloxone for good measure. Which would mean that when Marta thought she got the medications wrong, she actually didn't. She gave Harlan the correct medication and correct dosage, due to being an experienced and badass nurse. The switcheroo didn't work, but instead made her think she had fucked up. Harlan was completely fine, and the blood tox report confirms it. Damn. Furthermore, when Nana saw Marta leaving, thinking it was Ransom, she was seeing him again for the second time that night. Or so she thought. Ransom, you're back. All of this is great, but it doesn't mean jack shit. They have no evidence and Marta's full confession to mixing up the vials. Blanc continues, saying that Ransom tried to return the naloxone later, but the character sensing doggos blew his plans and woke up Meg. Elliot is still not completely buying it, but Wagner loves it. When Ransom heard of Harlan's suicide instead of murder, he hired Blanc to expose Marta. Enter. Benoit Blanc. Unable to get back and return the naloxone, Ransom's only chance was during the funeral, when no one was around. No one except Fran, who saw him putting the life-saving drug back. Fran then got the tox report from her cousin, My cousin, who's a receptionist at the medical examiner's office. And blackmailed Ransom instead, who believed his plan had worked. Except then he discovered that Marta had, or rather hadn't, screwed up the medication. So his priority became destroying the talks report that would prove her innocence. Still following? Good. So Ransom then blew up the medical examiner's office to destroy the innocence evidence and send the blackmail note on to Marta with a later time for Fran while he went to the original appointment with her and jacked her full of morphine, burning the talks report in the process. He then guided Marta through to the scene where she would find a morphine Fran and he would call the police on her, framing her for Fran's murder as well as Harlan's. Marta realises that Fran didn't say you did this, but rather... You did this. You did this. Cause you made the help call you Hugh. Cause you're an asshole. Ransom's plan went haywire when they took him into custody and Marta instead called the ambulance herself, because she's not a murderer, but a good person and saved Fran's life. 
The hospital call to confirm that Fran is indeed alive and Blanc tells the detectives to take Hugh into custody, preparing to take Fran's statement. Ransom rounds on Marta, telling her he was never going to let her take his ancestral home from him. Blanc explains how all this self-made stuff is bullshit, with Harlan buying the house in the 80s from a Pakistani real estate merchant, triggering Ransom. Shut up, Blanc! Shut up! <laughs> Shut up with that Kentucky Fried Foghorn Leghorn drawl! Ultimately, they still have nothing on Ransom. Attempted murder and arson? He'll be out in no time, and then he's going to ruin Marta's life. Oh. Plot twist, Fran really is dead. Ransom just confessed, oh, and Wagner recorded the whole thing. Game over. Realising he's fucked, Ransom goes all in on the black moment, grabbing one of the knives and lunging at Marta. He's too close for Blanc and the others to stop him, and Chekhov's gun fires. Make that one actual murder and two attempted murders. In the resolution, Linda enters Harlan's office, replacing the baseball, which has been a bit of a narrative transition device this whole time by the way, and finds the blank letter Harlan intended to give her, knowing it isn't blank at all. We, uh, we had our own secret way of communicating. The rest of the family turn away and consider their lives as commoners as Ransom is led away by the polis, with Richard giving the big unto them. Linda uses her lighter to read the letter and discovers Richard's infidelity. There's one reveal left though. Blanc isn't as shitty a detective as Marta thinks. He clocked the blood on her shoe right away. Yeah, see? See, he did. She won by playing her way, not theirs. Marta ponders on what to do with the family. Blanc thinks they should be left to their fate, but he knows Marta still has a kind heart. The epilogue shows a new power dynamic has been established. Ransom gets put in the car, Richard has a black eye, and the family are at the mercy of Marta. It's her house, her rules, and her coffee. So that's the synopsis and story structure to Knives Out. The hook, Fran discovering Harlan's body. The inciting incident, Blanc receiving an envelope of cash and being brought onto the case. The first act turning point, the reveal that Marta may have killed Harlan and her having to stay one step ahead of Blanc in order to avoid being caught. The midpoint, the will reading and all the parasites being punted. The second act turning point, Fran's murder and Marta confessing to Blanc and the climax? The classic whodunit reveal. Three acts, two genres, and expectations subverted, but then also met and, if I may be so bold, exceeded. Now, let's take a look at the rest of it. Ryan Johnson doesn't do things by halves. The most obvious theme at play is family, the connections of family and the dangers of nepotism. All of Harlan's children and their spouses rely on him, and they're all intensely protective of their living situations and handouts from him. They all hate each other and are squabbling for power within their closely knit circle. The only one of them who truly has anything of her own is Linda, and even then, it's through her father's actions, which I'll get to in a moment. It shows the dangers of over-reliance on heritage, with none of them having truly earned anything and having it all taken away when they are cut out of the will. The only one who was truly self-made was Harlan, and his grandchildren and their children became complacent on his earnings. Generations of teat suckling. Going from Walt and Linda, who at least kind of tried, down to Ransom, Meg and Jacob, who are at best, parasites surviving on Harlan and the status quo. The other primary theme is that of class, of entitlement, of believing you're simply better than someone because of the circumstances of your birth. The Frombies think they're the righteous ones, better than the help because of who they are. None of them can remember where Marta's family is even from, and they all consider her beneath them. Ultimately, it's her, the foreign outsider who upsets the apple cart. Harlan realises the error of his ways and cuts them all loose when he meets the genuinely deserving person in the form of Marta. They say they'll support her, yet none of them wanted her at the funeral. In the end, the tables of power turn and she wins, not because she was trying to, 
Not because she played their games, but because she was true to herself. They're so caught up in their own versions of the world, they all misremember the events of the party to put themselves front and centre, with Marta as a happy, submissive presence who is ultimately happy in her place. The reality is quite different. They end up out on their asses, and although that's where they should be left, it's implied Marta's humanity and compassion will win out and she'll help them. Ultimately, that may be the greater victory, helping those who thought they were better than you and making them realise no one is ever better than anyone else. Except the Nazi child. Fuck Nazis. Marta is the protagonist, the hero of the film, and possibly one of the nicest people you could ever meet. Aside from being a literal caregiver to Harland, she's his friend. We see their relationship in flashbacks, and she goes above and beyond in her role as simply an administrator of healing. He needed a friend. She has no ulterior motives. She never set out to claim Harlan's will from the rest of the Frombies. For the most part, she wants nothing to do with them. She's humble, living in an apartment with her mother and sister. She literally cannot lie. She's sympathetic, giving Harlan an ear and listening to his woes. After giving him the vile shit he needs, she offers to give him some morphine to help him sleep, but also makes light of it. She's got a good sense of humor. You wanna do drugs? She's strategic, but she doesn't play to win. When she and Harlan play Go, she doesn't beat him because she's trying to. She's just doing her own thing, and that's what helps her win against the Frombies. She's horrified when she thinks she gave Harlan the wrong medication and is hesitant to go along with his plan. If it was just her ass on the line, she'd probably accept the false charges and Ransom would have won. But it's not just her ass on the line. It's that of her mother and her sister to an extent, and the fear of leaving them in the hands of an increasingly ruthless and horrible immigration policy. It's her mother's safety that makes her go along with Harlan, going through the charade of amateur theatrics to protect her and spurring her on when Blanc begins his investigation. That's what she wants, but what does she need? She needs to find her own voice within the Fromby dynamic, to find her own lioness. If everything had fallen to ruin, she most likely would have bargained for her mother's continued living situation, even if she had gone to jail. When we meet her, she's broken, burdened with guilt over Harlan's death and constantly on edge, symbolized by her cracked phone shown throughout the film. She does start to find her voice though, when she stands up to Walt when he threatens her mother, and then to Ransom when she realizes he set her up. Cause you're an asshole. She even seals his fate by lying about Fran's survival and holding off vomiting long enough to get Ransom's confession. Even when the Frombies turn on her, when they manipulate and try to threaten her, she still has their best interests at heart, telling Meg she'll take care of her and hinting that she'll continue to help the family after the events of the film. I should help them, right? She may intend to do so, but she's not going to be the same meek, subservient member of the perceived help anymore, symbolized in the final shot when she uses Harlan's mug and also in the directing and camera work. She ends the film standing over them. She has the power now, but that doesn't mean she's going to abuse it. Ransom counts on her being as selfish as him, running from Fran and leaving her to die, where instead, she tries to save her, even though it means coming clean to Blanc and possibly losing the fight. Her heart and her desire to do good wins out. Fran doesn't make it, but that isn't on her conscience. She's so nice, she can't even do a high-speed chase properly. She inherits everything because she's good. She's pure. And she wins because of this too. The Frombies are actually lucky that someone like Marta ended up inheriting everything. Maybe her presence will make them better people. Maybe. The Frombies themselves could all be described as antagonists to a degree and are definitely tricksters. They put on a happy, false facade in front of others as long as things are going their way, but they are all shapeshifters, capable of turning as soon as they sense danger. Out of all of them, Linda is the only successful one, and even then, not really. She started her real estate business with a million dollar loan from Harland. She's as self-made as this guy, 
My father gave me a small loan of a million dollars. Okay, she's definitely smarter, but she's still a snake in the grass, accusing Marta of sleeping with Harlan to secure her share of the inheritance. But she was smarter than her husband Richard, getting him to sign a prenup and being able to play her own game with Harlan with the invisible letters. She's smart enough not to be baited by Blanc and mostly stays out of the politics chat with the others at the party. Though she has her own dismissive views, particularly to Meg and her degree, she at least keeps it within her own inner circle. She's an asshole, no question about it, but she's a smart asshole. Richard is a dumbass, immediately being baited by Blanc into spilling the family's secrets. He's posturing and insincere, virtue signalling to Wagner about Hamilton and pretending he's actually a nice guy. He thinks Marta likes him and was happy to be involved in his pro-America do stuff by the rules chat. In reality, he's delusional. He doesn't even remember giving her his plate like she was one of the waiting staff. He's also cheating on Linda. As if that wasn't bad enough, he can't even hide it well, getting photographed and looking for the evidence. He clearly wasn't paying attention with Harlan's letter, as if he had been, he would have known that it was done with invisible ink. Instead, he thinks he's in the clear. His best idea comes with trying to get Marta to renounce the will. He's grown comfortable and complacent in his existence, telling Marta to get the lawyers to help Ransom before his world comes crashing down. Walt is a coward, inept and inadequate. He's afraid to do anything for himself, to make anything. He bases his career around his father's work and even needs a few drinks before he's willing to pitch anything to Harlan. He's blind to his son's neo-Nazi alt-right activities and, like most of them, lives in his own world. He's the one to go after Marta at her house, however, he doesn't even say his most threatening line to her. I get the feeling the family put him up to it, because they found him scary with his cane, a possible red herring to the audience, and he was meant to spook Marta, which doesn't work. His wife Donna is a frothing at the mouth xenophobe who watches too much Fox News and likes her booze, and it seems she's the greater influence on Jacob, who himself is a victim of his own privilege. The little right-wing fuckwit who hate streams Marta's harassment is shaped by his environment and his parents, and could probably stand to have better parental figures in his life, and to get off his phone. I suppose he might have no choice but to touch grass soon. Meg loves grass. She seems to be the best ally in the family to Marta, standing up for her and actually has a relationship with Fran aside from seeing her as the help. But, like all of them, when her lifestyle is threatened, she turns, albeit at the duress of the rest of the family, most likely Linda. Joni is a typical airhead, someone who can't really survive in the real world. She tries to convince people she's an influencer and tries to promote a free lifestyle, but she's also false, stealing from Harlan and ruining her own good thing due to her greed. Meg defends Marta from the family and, in a way, is another victim. It's Joni's greed that threatens her education and she apologises to Marta in the third act for telling them about her mother. They're not the worst. Meg is just easily manipulated and Joni is a greedy fool. They'll probably do anything for Marta now to make sure they get at least some of the money. Harlan is the herald of the film. It's his death that kicks everything into motion. And that itself was kicked into motion by him changing the will. The real genius in the family, he built his empire up from nothing, becoming one of the most successful writers of his generation, and taking good care of his mother. His name also comes from an old mystery style book. He has a particularly antagonistic relationship with Ransom, who he sees a lot of himself in. They usually like to have an audience for their drama, and he might have been as bad as the others before the events of the film. He became another victim of complacency and watched his own children become dependent on him, which he later admits may have been to keep them beneath him. It was Marta who showed him a better class of person. When he realises he's about to die, his only concern is making sure Marta isn't found guilty. He continues to watch over her during the course of the film in the form of his portrait. It's actually smiling after everything has been wrapped up. It's just unfortunate that he was never actually going to die anyway and the whole thing didn't need to happen if it weren't for the actions of one man. Ransom is the true antagonist of the film. Harlan's trust fund grandson has potential, but he refuses to use it. Smarter than he lets on, he masterminded the whole switching of the medications and would have gotten away with it too if Marta hadn't been such a good nurse and person. He's the only one of the family to use his brain and he uses it to kill his grandfather to secure his share of the inheritance back. He's a shadow to Marta, also being able to beat Harlan at go and smart enough to think on his feet when he realises Marta didn't mix up the medications. He's also capable of straight up murder, twice attempted. 
but he's still too dumb to realise a fake knife from a real one. He even got the idea of this whole scheme from being Harlan's research assistant for a summer. His greatest works are ultimately those of ruthless selfishness. Elliot and Wagner form a double act, the voices of the audience. Elliot is the more discerning, experienced detective, unwilling to believe anything until all of the facts line up, the more sceptical audience member. Wagner just loves the show Blank is putting on and represents the joy of the audience at the final reveal. Together, they work effectively to keep us grounded in a world of twists and turns and larger-than-life characters. And speaking of larger-than-life characters, we come to Benoit Blanc. Mr. Blanc, if you please. The breakout character of Knives Out comes fully formed straight out of a mystery novel none of us have read yet. The detective archetype through and through, he's perceptive, intelligent and tenacious. He sees through the Frombies and their self-made patter, pointing it out on numerous occasions. He's got his quirks, constantly smoking a cigar and his own unique manner of speaking. He's smarter than he appears, immediately clocking the blood on Marta's shoe. Where a lesser detective might have just used this as a sign of Marta's guilt and closed the case, he continues probing, keeping Marta close by until all the pieces fall into place. He's also the one to give Nana any sense of autonomy, treating her as a human being instead of an over-the-hill burden. He lashes out at the Frombies when he realises Marta's innocence, telling them what he really thinks of them, another possible voice of the audience quirk. His sexuality is left ambiguous, at least in this film, though most people already clocked it. He does his job well, even if he seems at times to be a few steps behind Marta, another subversion of expectations. He uses his wit to unravel everything and delivers the classic reveal in the climax. Although Knives Out is Marta's story, it's undoubtedly Blanc's film, and Craig laps up every moment, all but literally chewing the scenery with joy, especially after the better part of 20 years playing Bond. He's the character viewers will come back for and may stand the test of time as Ryan Johnson's greatest creation. The dialogue in Knives Out is funny and realistic. Thank you. That means a lot. You really feel that these are real people talking to each other, especially when it comes to the Frombies, all sniping and hating on each other. The pettiness of some of them really shines through. We've all seen family squabbles at some point in our lives, and tell me they don't end up looking like this. How about some more cookies, you? You want some more cookies? Great. We also see how comfortable Harlan and Marta are with each other and how they like to joke around. That's elder abuse. I'm going to call the AARP. Don't make me get the belt, abuelo. Interactions like these really help to convince the audience of their relationship and dynamic. The characters speak in ways that are true to themselves, but we're not really interested in the Frombies, are we? I forgive you. Knives Out's main attraction is its larger-than-life character Blanc, so it's fitting that he gets his own larger-than-life dialogue. My presence will be ornamental. You have a regurgitative reaction to mistruthing. <laughs> the donut hole has a hole in its center. It is not a donut hole, but a smaller donut with its own hole. And our donut is not a hole at all. <laughs> that, that, that is hooey. It's snappy, witty, and contains two of my most favorite lines of recent years. What were the overheard words by the Nazi child masturbating in the bathroom? I can't really give Johnson credit for that one, as it's a Michael Shannon original. There's also a lot of subtlety at play. The family fight with Ransom seems on its surface to be about him being cut from the will, but it soon devolves into them all fighting between themselves. Why? Because they all know they have nothing of real value to offer and their sense of self-preservation kicks in, guiding them not to better themselves but to tear down others in an attempt to make themselves look better by comparison. Exposition dumps in the original interview scenes are funny, not only establishing the night but introducing each character and their own way of seeing the world. We know everything there is to know about them without being beaten over the head with the info. The rule of show, don't tell is expertly demonstrated by the blood on Marta's shoe. Never once is it mentioned in dialogue, until it's all over, yet the audience knows and it becomes one of the biggest causes of tension within the film. It's a tight script, full of witty lines and memorable quotes. It, it makes no damn sense. It compels me though. 
I am beyond, over the moon. I mean, this has been such an incredible experience and finally we get to, you know, get it out there. It's been a year exactly now and and it's just very exciting. It was just, I had, we had so much fun doing this and I loved working with everyone. Knives Out had its premiere at the 44th Toronto International Film Festival on the 7th of September 2019 and was released theatrically by Lionsgate on November the 27th. It reviewed fantastically well, holding a 97% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes and going on to gross over 300 million worldwide on an estimated budget of 40 million. The film was a strong entry into the murder mystery and whodunit genres, which was already having a good run with ensemble cast films like Murder on the Orient Express. So what made the film so popular and do so well? Daniel Craig's Benoit Blanc was instantly memorable and a standout, garnering Craig hefty praise. Praise was also given to the rest of the cast too, including Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon and America's ass, Chris Evans. The set design is second to none, with no detail overlooked in creating the home of Harlan Fromby. Of course, the screenplay was a banger. It was nominated for an Academy Award but lost out to Parasite. The music as well, composed by Ryan Johnson's cousin and longtime collaborator Nathan Johnson, is a satirical send-up of the murder mystery genre while being a pretty good score in itself. Yes, he has a career in his own right, but he is Johnson's cousin so I'd be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to point out a real-life nepotism joke. Something about how the movie can be about the dangers of nepotism and still making use of nepotism in its constructions and OH SHIT! Speaking of life imitating art, Netflix ended up paying just under half a billion dollars to secure the sequel rights to Knives Out, with the sequel, Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery, releasing in 2022. I guess Ryan wasn't as shrewd as Harlan when it came to negotiations. I missed Knives Out original run. I was working at a cinema at the time and when we worked films we sat in on them to make sure nothing untoward happened. But my schedule just never included it and uh, I ended up missing it. I've never hugely been into the murder mystery genre. I appreciate it as much as the next person but it did take me a while to track the film down on streaming. I'm glad I did though. I've recommended it to people since and I've watched it a few more times. I think it's a great film. Craig has so much fun playing the role, you can't help but have fun watching him. I'd need to revisit Looper again, but I think it might just be my favourite Ryan Johnson film. I can't really find anything to fault with it. It has enough twists and turns to keep the story fresh, and although it's obvious that Ransom did it on rewatch, that doesn't take away from the fun of going through the journey. Plus, it's usually on rewatches that murder mysteries become more fun. When you see how the clues are laid out, point into the conclusion and you realise that they actually knew what they were doing while they were making it. I'd give Knives Out 5 stars out of 5, with a masturbating Nazi child sign of approval. Kids today with the internet, it's amazing. So that's my screenplay analysis and review of Knives Out. If you want to watch Knives Out and you live in the UK, you can't. It isn't on Netflix, despite the fact that they own the rights to Glass Onion and the rest of the franchise, and it isn't available on any other streamers either. I had to rent it just to watch it again because I didn't take my own advice and buy it when I had the chance. Buy physical media, people. Do you agree with my analysis? Let me know in the comments down below, along with anything you think I missed or any other films you'd like me to cover. Like and subscribe to the channel, as I'm a desperate whore and I'll show you a good time, and stay tuned for the next one, which will be Jurassic Park 3, because Jurassic Park is coming back into cinemas and I want to capitalise on that relevancy. Thank you for watching. I've been Stumo, and until next time, remember, dogs always know.